maximizing happiness, I'm just going to say, here's Peter. Thank you. Uh, well, and as John Cleese would have said at this point, now for something completely different. Um, so uh, I don't have any new data. Um, I'm not an expert in the area. I have a bunch of thoughts. And I put them all in a very long paper, which I didn't realize I was supposed to put on a website, so I apologize for that. But it's something that I can do, perhaps, by sharing the thoughts with you here. And um, I do want to take advantage of the fact that I'm in the final session, and I think I've got the grayest hair of any of the presenters, to thank the organizer, Matt, and Dawn. And to thank you all, I think this has been a great uh, conference. I've certainly learned a ton. I've been very impressed by the constructive quality of the discussion. And um, I think we should recognize that this has been a positive experience. So, well, <laughs> what we might have hoped for. OK, so let's see if, this, uh, if I can get this to work. This is the advancer here. <coughs> Does that work? OK, so um, we've been worried about what we get when we get a measure of subjective well-being. And uh, I was trying to s ask, how might you think about that question from the standpoint <clears throat> of a philosopher? And I thought what I'd try to do is link together some rank evolutionary speculation, uh, some recent research uh, in effective and cognitive neuroscience, some evidence from an emerging consensus in uh, cognitive social psychology, uh, to see if we could put those facts together to explain some of the patterns that we find and that we sometimes find puzzling when subjective well-being is systematically measured. <clears throat> and then that might enable us to say something about the normative interest that these measurements might play. If we knew what was going on in the measurements, we might be able to say more about what we could do with them. Uh, so here's my rank evolutionary speculation. Um, Start off with the simple idea that responding to questions about subjective well-being involves thinking. Um, what might thinking be for? Uh, what is any thinking for? Uh, this is a dumb question. It's a dumb question. Of course, thinking is performing accurate representations of one's state in the environment, except nature's not the college board. As far as nature is concerned, my having an accurate representation of the world is worth nothing until it translates somehow into my capacity to uh, effectively uh, contribute to my inclusive fitness. So thinking should be understood functionally, perhaps, in terms of what it could do for inclusive fitness. And William James gave the answer to this question. Thinking is first, last, and always for my doing. And uh, if you think about it, the whole contribution that my thinking can make to whatever prospect I have now of enhancing my inclusive fitness, this all lies ahead of me, and it all lies in what I can do. Um, OK, well, how would thinking contribute to doing? Um, well, if it just gave me an accurate representation of the current state of affairs, that would not be enough. Um, thinking has got, if it's going to guide my doing, it's got to inform me all right, but then it's got to guide what I go on to do and help me monitor or regulate what I go on to do. And um, so we could speculate that even our thinking about well-being is involved in this notion of informing and guiding. Hey, this works all by itself. I just have to try to keep up. Um, <clears throat> James might have added, uh, thinking is for doing, and all doing actually lies in the future. Every act, even the simplest act, say, following a moving object with my eye, uh, starts now and continues into the future. It doesn't go backwards in time. That act, that movement, will be more successful and more efficient if I accurately anticipate the trajectory of the object that I'm following. So if I can anticipate here and now what will happen in the then and there, I will gain accuracy and efficiency and effectiveness. As a result, natural selection should have, will have, this is this rank part, should have relentlessly favored organisms that do better at anticipating, even a little bit better, um, whether they're predators, whether they're prey, uh, <laughs> can't quite keep up, foraging, uh, if they're engaged in social contestation or social coordination, if they're engaged in mate selection or alliance formation. In all of these respects, the organism that anticipates a little better 
does a little better, so long as doing better doesn't cost too much. And uh, you probably know that your brain, it's 1.5% of your weight. It consumes about 20% of your calories, about 11% of your blood flow. There's a high premium on getting the most you can using scarce neurological resources in any organism. And so brains face what an engineer would call an efficient coding problem. It's a problem that computers also face, they have to solve, which is how do you compress a large volume of information, such as we receive from our senses, compress that in such a way as not to lose the vital information, but to eliminate what you don't have to perceive. And it appears that brains and computer systems solve this problem in the same way by detecting redundancy in the information. They selectively encode the genuinely new information. So the premium is on uh, detecting redundancy and selecting for the information that has genuinely new content. But the only way to detect redundancy is to have expectations because it's only by comparing the current input with an expectation of what that input would be that you know whether or not it's redundant relative to your information state. So in this sense, too, it follows that expectation is going to be a fundamental organizing principle of the mind, of perception, of learning, of action. OK, James could also have added, I'm talking a lot for James here, <clears throat> my feeling is also first, last, and always for my doing, for the very same reasons. And that might suggest that the things that you feel should be things that can play a role in informing and guiding or regulating your conduct. And once again, that means feeling is going to have this future-oriented or prospective dimension to it. So uh, think about the distinctive emotions of fear, surprise, anger, sadness, and so on. Um, fear alerts you to the presence of harm in the environment, potential harm in the environment. It mobilizes your physiology. It galvanizes your attention. It primes certain kinds of thought and certain kinds of memories in the direction of information that's relevant to meeting a danger. And so fear is a way of shifting your orientation toward the future in such a way as to be an appropriate response to threat or a danger. Similarly for surprise, anger, and so on, but to different dimensions of the ways in which your current situation might have prospects or perils. And so again, we should think that a core feature of the architecture of affect should be the generation and revision of expectations. But what affect does that is distinctive is it adds a valence to these expectations. Fear is related to danger or harm, so it's a negative affect. Trust is related to credence and reliance and acceptance and approach, and so it's a positive affect. Liking is related to enjoyment. It's a positive affect. And so what positive affects do, as opposed to negative ones, is they supply motivation to do something, and they encourage you to approach or accept the thing that uh, you're motivated toward. Negative sentiments like fear motivate you to avoid and to reject and to guide your behavior according. This basic fact about the affective system. Perfectly general result here that you use, you can get in artificial as well as natural systems, the so-called good regulator theorem of Conant and Ashby. A good regulator for a system is a model of the system. Well, good here means something specific. An efficient and effective regulator of a system is a model of the system. Well, what does it mean? Well, a model in this case is a representation of possible inputs, expectations of outcomes given those inputs, expectations of how responses that you would make to the inputs would alter the outcomes, conditional probabilities, and a value assignment to these various different outcomes. So if you're regulating a temperature system, your value assignment has to do with what the ideal temperature is. Uh, your model is given a certain input of, let's say, external heat. What would that do to temperature? How would turning on the compressor reduce it? And so a regulatory system is a system which operates on a forward model. And the better the model, the more efficient and effective the regulator. And uh, those who have studied, those who have built artificial systems to do this, and those who have studied intelligent motor control and skilled action 
in animals and humans, find that it is indeed via an, a forward model that we direct these kinds of skilled motions. When you reach out to grab your cup, your brain is continually generating a forward model of what you should expect from that flexion and extension. If there is a violation of it, the way there was this morning when I was trying to unplug my computer and the cord that I grabbed under the desk felt too thick, if there's a violation of the expectation, then I modify the trajectory of my hand and arm. And this is a feedback system that operates in real time. OK, well, what about other systems? Reinforcement learning, which was long thought to be an associative process of habit ingraining, is now believed to be uh, not an associative process, but in fact a process by which the organism identifies and shifts its responses in the direction of the most predictive information it's in, in its environment. That is to say, the organism is efficient in its environment if it can identify the features that are actually predictive and shift the response, like food anticipation, to those features. This generates information from the environment about risk and reward. Uh, this is <clears throat> the well-known studies of Schultz and colleagues. Your affect and reward system, which contains this information, enters the perceptual stream very early. And so the information that's reaching cognition is already being coded effectively, positively or negatively, relevant to certain actions, relevant to certain responses as opposed to other responses. And you can look at these models and you can find that the anticipation of reward or punishment with a certain degree of probability predicts to the animal's behavior. And as a result, when they apply optimizing models to motor control or uh, in, the, in the naturalistic setting to uh, foraging behavior or mate selection, the optimizing models are actually highly predictive of what the organism is going to do, maybe even explanatory. Wait, <laughs> what about, this is something you all know more about than I do, the extensive literature in psychology and behavioral economics of conspicuous failures to form accurate probability expectations to optimize decision making. <clears throat> what about the dual process of the mind that's used to explain this evidence? For example, in Kahneman's recent book, System one, it's ancient, associative, affect-driven, automatic, fast, impulsive, innocent of logic and statistics, heuristic-based, rough and ready, terrible at probability inferences. System two, which can do things like statistics and logics and probability inferences, is new, slow, more effortful, requires control, and limited in capacity. And so we're constantly victims of system one's dispositions, which Maybe they're rough and ready on the whole good, but they're not at all good about this kind of business of optimizing or calculating probabilities and utilities. Except that when we stick microelectrodes into the brain of a macaque and make recordings from single neurons, what we find is probabilities and utilities. It's hard to believe, but uh, I'll, I'll present some of this evidence very quickly. Uh, here you're seeing a scatter plot of firing rates of dopamine neurons in the midbrain of a macaque. Here you're seeing a system in which there's a signal that occurs at this point and a reward that is or is not presented at this point. You train the animal on this system, 20, 30 trials, and you look to see what happens when the light comes on and what happens when the food arrives. If you give it food with probability zero, nothing happens when the light comes on. You get a big spike when the food arrives. If you give it food with probability one, after it's trained, when the stimulus comes on, big spike. When the food arrives, no response. No news is received at that point. The dopamine signal is not a pleasure signal. It's an informational signal. And so you don't update when the food arrives because you thoroughly and correctly predicted it. What if you give it with probability 0.5? Well, when the signal comes on, you get a certain size of spike. And when the food arrives, you get an intermediate size of spike. What if it's 75%, higher spike, lower spike, 25%, lower spike, higher spike? <clears throat> Looking over here, this is a train of spike activity after the signal has arrived in anticipation of the reward event. What you see is a small buildup of activity at probability 0 and at probability 1. You see some, well, 
You see some buildup of activity at 0.75 and 0.25. When do you see maximum buildup here? Where risk is highest, probability 0.5. This is a risk function. This is an expected value function. Okay. What happens if you don't give it food that it's predicted at probability 0.5? Here you see the risk being uh, anticipated by the neural firing rates. Uh, here it gets the food, it spikes up. Here the risk is anticipated by the neural firing rates. The moment arrives, it doesn't get the food, here's the signal. That's the error signal of misprediction. What about looking on the reward side? Train an animal on small, medium, and large rewards, and look at the median change of activity depending upon the size of the reward. This is a linear change in reward. It's a linear change in firing rate. What is this? This is relative reward. If you've trained it between a small and a medium reward, this is the response you get. If you've trained it between a small and a large reward, this is the response you get. What if you've trained it between a medium and a large reward? This is the response you get. Okay, so, so, Bacox, what do we care? Um, you can't go around sticking single microelectrodes into humans, not typically anyhow, so you have to use more indirect means of measuring, like blood oxygen levels. This is a similar region to the human brain, the ventral striatum, to the one that we were looking at in the macaque. These are people who've been trained on a gambling experiment. In the gambling experiment, they've been uh, given a reward for a certain card being presented on the screen with probability zero or probability one. And in this area, we see a linear activation. In this area, we see an activation that reflects the relative risk of the information that it's getting. OK, so maybe we on macaques do calculate probabilities. And we do calculate utilities. And it turns out that when we know these, we can predict the organism's response. So the answer to the puzzle about system one and system two may be this. Look at the problems the system was designed to solve and test the way, test it the way it works as, let's say, researchers in perceptual recognition, motor control, foraging behavior, implicit decision making have tested it. Then look at the neural realization. These all share a certain architecture that we've been describing, this feed-forward feedback tuning architecture. This architecture is neurologically efficient and cheap, and with increasing information, it increases the reliability of the estimates over time. And then recall our rank evolutionary speculations. If thinking and feeling are about acting, and this means they have to inform and guide, and if an efficient way to be informed and guided is by something like probabilities and utilities and expected value, then we should expect that gazillions of generations of natural selection in intelligent animals would have done a good job of discovering Bayesian probability and decision theory. It took us humans much less time. OK. Now let's look over at cognitive social psychology. And there we see an emerging consensus that, in fact, the affective system is to be understood as a system the chief function of which is to provide information and to regulate behavior. This is the paradigm that got started by Zions and developed by Schwartz and Clore. Uh, it's been linked by uh, Nessie, who's an evolutionary psychologist, and Ellsworth, who is a cognitive psychologist. It's been linked to evolutionary function. Emotions are modes of functioning shaped by natural selection that coordinate physiological change, like arousal, cognition, like memory and inference, motivation, <laughs> behavioral and subjective responses, like feelings, and patterns that increase the ability of the organism to meet the adaptive challenges of situations that have recurred over evolutionary time. So we could expect humans to be equipped with battery of emotions, battery of basic emotions, which respond to different kinds of variables in recurring situation and adjust behavior, cognition, attention, motivation to the dispositions and prospects that those variables result in. OK, so let's go back to system one, system two. When you ask someone about overall life satisfaction, you're talking to system two. You're giving the person a questionnaire to fill out. This is explicit declarative reasoning. Okay? Given its limited capacities, this system is going to rely on heuristics. It may be that heuristics predominate in system two rather than system one, which is system one being calculative. 
A principal heuristic is the affect heuristic, as uh, Slovic has argued. And in this heuristic, your conscious judgments are guided implicitly or explicitly by felt affective responses when you raise the question with yourself. So someone sticks a clipboard in your face and says, "What? how satisfied are you with your life at present? You have a spontaneous answer. Where does it come from? An answer is the affect heuristic. You have a certain affective response to the question, and you use that to answer it. <clears throat> OK. So if our affective system is designed to inform and guide real-time actions to meet our needs for physical and mental health, affiliation, <clears throat> extra time giving a talk, uh, security, <laughs> social acceptance, family formation, control, learning goal attainment, and so on in recurrent situations, if that's what our affective system was designed to do, and it does this in response to environmental information in the way described, then if the affect heuristic is what's driving these subjective well-being judgments, we might be able to explain why they show certain patterns, but also why they might have a certain normative interest for us, why they might be picking up decent information about well-being, which is relevant to decision-making and policy, which thankfully would be a very nice result. OK, well, here are just a few examples of patterns the famous literature on set point habituation and adaptation. First question, why is the typical person positive? Why would the typical level of, uh, uh, of well-being be positive rather than neutral? The habituation view can't explain that. Habituation returns you to a neutral point. Why is it positive? Remember what positive does. Positive is about approach and acceptance. If our set point were neutral or negative, we would be indifferent to exploring the environment. We'd be indifferent about trial and error. We would be, if it were negative, we would in fact be actively rejecting of new information. If the expected value from my next action were not positive, I wouldn't perform it. OK. I would look for something else to do, like sit still. Positive and negative affects should be separable in this way because they're tracking often different features of the situation. Anger may be picking up on one feature, confidence picking up on another. The resulting behavior reflects your response to a range of variables. Why is there a tendency to revert to a baseline after changes? Well, a system, in order to be sensitive, if a sensory system, for example, if it receives a stimulus and then the stimulus continues without changing, what it will do is eventually attenuate the influence of that stimulus in order to be responsive to other new stimuli. So we should expect the system to have generally this kind of a restorative function in it if it's information processing. But sometimes maybe the baseline levels adapt and sometimes they don't. These are ordinary incidents in life. They're many of them perfectly predictable, like age. Uh, there are many of them socially normative and shared. There are some of them situations that can be recovered from. Uh, and so these we should expect baseline levels to return. But in others, habituation doesn't take place. When you're unemployed, you're in an untenable situation in a contemporary society. If you're unable to meet basic needs in a relatively poor society, you have to have a continued motivation to try to keep at it so people who in a poor society can't meet their basic needs will show lower subjective well-being. Those who do, however, succeed reasonably well at meeting their needs, they're showing an important adaptive skill, they can have relatively high subjective well-being. Social exclusion and isolation, again, are related to the needs we have for affiliation and security, temporary versus permanent disability. If it's a disability you can do something about, it's going to be more unsatisfactory than that you can do something about, it's going to be more unsatisfactory than a permanent one as uh, Jubel, I guess, showed. OK. Just clarification? Yeah. I'm confused. Uh, why so positive? You said to motivate us to not sit still. Yeah. But now you said, why negative without recovery? Also yeah. To, sorry, I don't understand. Well, if you look at these individuals, it's not that they're net negative about their existence. It's just their baseline is lower than. Why would we, though, would reduce my well-being? Mm -hmm. How does this? Sorry? Why, does we, why would widowhood reduce my affect? How is it? Well, I don't why see Why would the, it? 
have any effect. Yeah. Is that the question? Well, if you've got, uh, as, as, as humans do, we've got a basic need for affiliation. This is one of the fundamental things. If we're a social being, we can't get along without others. We have a very strong need for affiliation. We establish strong affiliative ties. When you lose such a tie, you should experience a negative symbol, a signal from your system telling you something's gone wrong and needs to be repaired. If you go on and find a new partner, you've repaired it and you can continue. <clears throat> on the other hand, if you're being continually socially excluded or if you're suffering long-term unemployment um, and uh, if you are in a socially uh, uh, stigmatized category, <clears throat> you should not be satisfied with your situation. And so there should be a lower baseline level for these conditions than these conditions. That's the thought. But everybody is above the midpoint, typically, in these kinds of cases. Except, again, if you're unable to meet basic needs and so on. OK. Um, why th this helps us understand how you can have people in, in the underdeveloped world who report a reasonably high level of satisfaction with their existence, but then when you ask them, are they thriving, they say, no, the majority say they're struggling. What is struggling for them? Struggling is using the skills that they have to meet the needs that they confront in their situation, and if they're reasonably successful at it, then indeed the system should be telling them that's the thing to do, continue invest effort in that, that's a positive signal. If what they're doing is not accomplishing that, they should be getting a negative signal from their system. Okay, um, finally normatively, if this story is right, it would be some reason to expect that affect-driven judgments of subjective well-being would tell us something interesting about objective as well as subjective well-being, about meeting needs, establishing relationships, achieving social recognition, gaining knowledge or autonomy. It would be some reason to think that informed preferences have more authority than uninformed ones because we learn in this process. The whole idea of these systems is that they're learning systems. And so cases where you've been able to make certain kinds of choices, you've been able to experience feedback from those choices, those preferences should have more credibility as indicators of well-being than when you don't have such information. And finally, it suggests why utilitarianism can be a green philosophy. If what we learn about subjective well-being, if that's what utilitarians take as a central concern, uh, what we learn from it is you don't have to pile a massive quantity of material goods on people. In fact, you can pile increasing amounts of material good and have no net inf influence on their subjective well-being. How can you, in those situations, improve their subjective well-being? Well, we were told something about that in uh, Carol's paper. People who do have their basic needs met, those individuals care more about things like their social connections, respect, health, and so on. People who don't have their needs met, that's what we should focus energy on. If the needs are met, the kinds of goods that we have to give people aren't the kinds of goods that are hugely resource intensive. They're things like good relationships, opportunities to learn, uh, possibilities for social expression and control. Thanks. I'm sure there are lots of questions, but they will wait till after our second speaker. Take it away, Eric. Thank you very much. Well, let me tell you, it's not easy to go last at a conference like this one after all of these wonderfully interesting papers, um, and right after uh, Peter on top of that. Um, do we have the device? Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. What is it, PC people, F5? Ah, very good. So I came to the topic of happiness originally as a philosopher of science. I was interested in questions like, um, well, questions concerning modeling and measurement, what it means to say that you've measured something, and to, the ex to what extent um, it can be said that we've succeeded in measuring happiness. Um, 
And I've written some, I guess, critical things about this literature, trying to clean up perceived conceptual messes and so on. But over the course of the years reading this literature, I've come to think that there really is um, a lot of material in the literature on happiness that's immediately relevant to traditional philosophical questions about the nature of the human condition. And this paper is, to some extent, an effort to spell out or to begin spelling out an answer to that. Um, I take a different approach from the one adopted by Peter, but I think we end up in a, a fairly similar place. Um, Here's just some, some terminology. I take subjective measures of well-being to be measures based on questions like this one from 1960, taking things all together. How would you say things are these days? And I take subjective well-being to be whatever those measures are intended to represent. And so that's why people also talk about measures of um, subjective well-being. If you read positive psychologists, especially the, the early ones, um, you might get the impression that this research is quite new. So here's a line from uh, Frank Stutzer, um, who said that in the past few years, economists have started seriously measuring happiness and figuring out what the determinants of happiness might be. And they wrote this in, in 2002. Now, it's certainly true that happiness measurement gained prominence after the emergence and rise of the positive psychology movement. That much is, is undeniable. But if you look at the actual... Uh, history of it, it turns out that you can trace an uninterrupted research tradition back almost a hundred years. Um, it seems to me, or from what, what my research has suggested anyway, that the first modern students of happiness were working in the 1920s and 30s. Um, the first serious effort to measure these um, states uh, that, that I've been able to identify is in marital success studies in the 1920s. Around this time, people were apparently intensely interested in marital um, satisfaction, and they tried to assess the extent to which people had happy marriages by distributing questionnaires, not unlike the ones that people still use today. Interestingly, in this literature, people were interested in the happiness of the marriage rather than the happiness of the people in it. That changed in the 1930s when a number of educational psychologists, um, especially one called Watson, who was active at Columbia University at the time, started studying um, happiness in the context of education. Watson started off by saying that um, everybody agrees that the ultimate aim of an education is to make people happy, so why don't we study it directly? That's interesting because the complaint is one that has echoes throughout the history of, um, of this um, uh, movement. I think the the rise of happiness measurement during this era can be attributed to the emergence of personality psychology and the beginnings of psychometrics shortly after World War I, when people started getting interested in identifying which soldiers would be prone to post-traumatic stress disorder and, um, and so on. In a nod to our host, I want to draw your attention briefly to, to one, I think, one of the best contributions to this literature of all time. Um, this is uh, from a book published in 1940 called Chart for Happiness, written by a Duke sociologist, somebody who might, must have been active somewhere uh, in these halls. Um, uh, Hornell Hart was interested in happiness. He was impressed with the success of epidemiology and curing bodily ailments, and he wanted to come up with a science of the mental that could do for mental health what epidemiology has done, done for bodily health. He devised a, a, a device he called the euphorimeter that assesses um, happiness in U4 units. Here I've just reproduced a graph. Um, he did panel studies. He published time series data. He was the first, to my knowledge, to do so. Um, here's a a guy who's an undergraduate male who's bumbling along just fine at between 200 and 300 U4 units, um, who's then greatly attracted by a girl but is not sure he can date her, which is a disaster, and then he gets a date, and then there's some uh, predictable drama. But it seems to me that the real... What is this U4? Is it a survey? <coughs> is so these, this, is a, this is one individual tracked over time, right, over the course of... Uh, the, the, the actual the, the unit, it's a survey. It's so a he, survey. Yeah, yeah. So he gave the same individual the same set of questions every day over the course of some two months. Like what? what questions? What is this question? <laughs> What's that? The question. What were the questions? It's a complicated battery of questions. Um, I, I can show you the, 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 the exact device, but it's a... Um, 
Well, here he used a shortish one. Um, one of the devices that he used was that he came up, he took happiness, looked it up in a thesaurus, and he looked at all the words that came up, all the synonyms and all the antonyms. Then he looked up all the antonyms and all the synonyms of those words, and he continued doing this until he had 50 words. Then he presented them to people with a, on a page, and he asked them to circle the ones that applied and cross out the ones that didn't apply, and he computed a, a unidimensional measure based on the number of, of uh, circles and, and crosses. Um, he defended this by saying that, in essence, I have 50 ways of asking my subject if he's happy or not, um, and um, it's not a completely crazy way to, to go about it. The history is wonderful, and I, I'll be glad to come back to this if, if you want. But it seems to me that it was really in the 60s and 70s that this research took off. Um, and there were a couple of, of parallel developments that matter. One was gerontology, which had emerged fairly recently, which is, in its essence, concerned with the well-being of, of old people. There were people in epidemiology who were interested in studying not just negative uh, things, ill health and so on, but were interested in positive states um, like happiness. And then there was the social indicator movement that had um, gained traction as a result of its rejection of traditional economic welfare measures, arguing that things like income is not what really matters, so therefore we have to measure these other things. In practice, what they ended up measuring was things like the number of telephones per household, the number of doctors per zip code, and so on. And of course, people then objected that that's not what ultimately matters either, right? And so they were pushed by the logic of their argument to focus on what they thought ultimately really mattered, and quite a number of them settled on um, happiness. Um, this was the era, by the way, when people discovered that happiness and satisfaction are not synonyms, <laughs> that they need to be treated as two separate constructs. This is when people started measuring them at the same time, arguing that we need to keep track of both of them. This was the era when people discovered that positive affect and negative affect are not perfectly inversely correlated, so that we need to measure both of them independently and take all of them into account. And so uh, um, a fascinating amount of scientific work was done during this era, and I think it's, it's still um, underappreciated. Now, doing um, induction over this history, taking uh, the long perspective here, I think one, one thing that stands out is that there was quite a bit of convergence when it comes to how to measure happiness and satisfaction and so on. So uh, Watson early on had, I don't know, 20 different measures. He ended up settling on one. Um, some people in the 70s, Andrew and um, Whitey, um, tested uh, um, 68 different measures of satisfaction. They picked one. Um, over the course of this history, the, you see that people have stopped using some of the measures that have been floating around. They focus on a small number of direct um, questions of the sort that we've seen over and over again um, today and, and yesterday. I think there were two reasons, broadly speaking, why people settled on a smallish number of, of measures. One is the obvious value of time series data. And so if you want to compare your results to those of Cantrell um, in the 60s, it's a good idea to use the same measure, right? But the other one was psychometric evidence for their validity. And so people from the 1930s on were intensely interested in psychometrics, and they spent a lot of time um, trying to explore whether there were better measures of happiness than the direct self-report questions. And by and large, they found that there weren't. Um, uh, I'll, I'll confess that I don't have any uh, numbers to represent this. I'm applying the intraocular trauma test, and uh, you know, I guess it's fallible, but I'll be glad to, to talk about that. Meanwhile, um, I, I also think it's interesting that over the course of this history, there's not a comparable convergence in conceptions of well-being. So you have a number of different conceptions of well-being, a number of different ideas about what well-being and happiness and satisfaction might mean, and you don't see the same sort of convergence in that regard. So there are cognitive view, attitudinal, uh, cognitive views, attitudinal views, affective views, hybrid views, um, and so on floating around. And it doesn't seem to me as though uh, people are converging in quite the same way. Now, another thing that's interesting is that the fact that people disagreed about how to define happiness and satisfaction did not seem to act as an obstacle at all when it comes to how to measure it. So people were quite happy to start off the paper by saying, you know, I don't know what happiness is. I'm going to use it in the same way as everybody else does. And here's my measure, and here's how I'm going to assess it. Um, that is apparently a co fairly common feature in um, uh, personality psychology, and it seems to be true um, here as well. That said, in spite of the fact that there's no obvious convergence here, I think nonetheless there is a way to read this literature without doing too much damage to it um, in such a way that 
many or most of these people, in fact, agree on the nature of well-being or the nature of um, um, happiness, perhaps. And it is to read these people as presupposing uh, what Parfit called preference hedonism. Right? So um, on the face of it, when you read many of these contributions, people will talk about happiness, they'll talk about satisfaction. Those things seem obviously different, right? Some of the scientific results established that there were different constructs. But nonetheless, um, when you read them closely, if you look at the passages where they talk about why happiness matters, why satisfaction matters, very often what people will say is that, well, at the end of the day, this is what people care about. All right. Uh, at the end of the day, people want to be happy. Um, there are data, of course, of this, as everybody knows. Right? Uh, people have asked uh, recent college grads and so on what they want for themselves. Um, you can ask parents what they want for their kids and so on. Very often, happiness will appear at the top of that list. What that suggests is that people want to be happy right, in their own lives, and they want to promote happiness in other people. So that's what gives us license to say that perhaps underlying all this work is um, an account of well-being according to which well-being is constituted by whatever mental states the person himself or herself desires. Okay? On this account, uh, there would still be some degree of disagreement between the different contributors. Right? Specifically, they disagree on what um, sort of states people want to be in. But on this reading, there are actually a great deal of agreement on um, the nature of well-being. Okay? Um, I'm not aware of anyone who's explicitly endorsed this. I don't know that preference hedonism is part of the conceptual framework uh, of most of these authors, many of whom, of course, preceded uh, Parfit. But nonetheless, if we take this line, if we interpret people in this way, that would reconcile much of what has been written on subjective well-being from the very beginning, almost 100 years ago until, until today. It would allow us to attribute to students of happiness and satisfaction a relatively plausible account of well-being. I think preference hedonism is more plausible than um, standard hedonistic views, for example. Um, and also, it would give people license to skirt issues about the definition of happiness, satisfaction, and so on. I mean, these are topics that have come up, right? Dan mentioned them, I think, in his first talk um, yesterday, right? If you define well-being in terms of happiness, then you've got to come up with a definition of happiness. It's a hard and deep question. If you think in, uh, of well-being in terms of the kind of consciousness that people desire, then it really doesn't matter how you define happiness, how you define satisfaction, right? If people want it, then it contributes to their well-being. If they don't want it, it doesn't, independently of what label you use. And I think that's um, an appealing uh, feature of this kind of account. Now, if you're with me so far, which you may or may not be, right? Uh, 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 if you agree that um, a, a not unreasonable reading of this literature is to think of people as trying to get at well-being in the sense of preference hedonism, then I could ask, why is it that we should restrict um, our attention uh, to things in the head? Why is it that we should allow people to have preferences only over the sort of mental states, the sort of things that might be floating around in their heads? Matt made this point earlier, right? Uh, we might just as well uh, um, allow them to have preferences of things outside of their heads. They can have preferences over things like having kids as well as ha feeling happy and so on. And if you think that preferences over things not in our heads ought to count toward our well-being, then uh, we're in the realm of preference satisfaction accounts of well-being, which I think is um, the way to go. I think preference satisfaction accounts have um, a number of, of appealing features. They're certainly more plausible than preference hedonism, in part because the restriction to things in the heads comes across as sort of um, arbitrary. And um, it would still allow us to make sense of virtually all literature on subjective well-being, right? When people study happiness, when they say it's important, when they talk about people's desire to be happy, what we should understand them to say is that happiness contributes to people well, people's well-being because people want to be happy, right? That's not to exclude the possibility that people want other things and that consequently those other things might also contribute to their well-being. Um, but nonetheless, at the end of the day on this reading, well-being is a matter of preference um, satisfaction. Um, it's the same thing except uh, uh, your, the objects of your preferences must be things in your head. So preference hedonist says that you're well off to the extent that you have the sort of consciousness that you desire, that you're in the sort of mental states that you want to be in. This um, has a wider scope. 
because it says that uh, well-being is a matter of uh, whichever preferences. So this is the Kahneman's conversion way converted from one to the other? He, I wouldn't want to attribute this move to Kahneman. No, no, no. But what you interpret his move in this frame. So we, OK, we can talk about it later. Yeah, I don't know. I'd, I'd love to know more about why, why you say that. I mean, you, you might be right. I just don't know. Um, okay, so um, this is how I propose we interpret this, um, this literature. Um, on this view, happiness has no essential connection to well-being, meaning that happiness is not a constituent of well-being uh, or anything of the sort, sort. Although, obviously, all this research has shown that there's a correlation under a wide range of conditions. Right? I think we can confidently say that happiness is correlated with well-being. To the extent that that's true, we can use indicators of happiness as proxies for well-being. Happiness might also be a cause of well-being, right? And well-being might be a cause of um, um, happiness. So happiness is not, a, it, um, it's not identical to well-being. It's not identical to utility. It's an object of preference and an argument in the utility function. Utility, I think, should be understood in the way economists understand it as an index or a measure of preference satisfaction that is as completely divorced from anything that might be floating around in your head. Um, and as a result, then, we can say that measures of happiness can act as proxies for um, well-being. The sort of view that I'm defending here, I, in a way, I sort of hate to defend the, the economic orthodoxy, but the view that I'm defending is actually really similar to the way orthodox economists approach um, welfare measurement using income as a proxy. So um, if you read the critiques of um, orthodox uh, welfare economics that you find in the works of some positive psychologist, you might come up with the, with the impression that economists believe that well-being is constituted by income or that only material goods matter to well-being or something. And um, that's just not true. That's not what economists um, of the orthodox kind believe. The reason why economists care so much about income is that they believe uh, it's one of the things that people want, right? Or that it allows you to buy things that you want. So uh, uh, you can prove this formally, right? You can, using tools in a standard microeconomics textbook, you can establish that when somebody gets more wealth, when their income goes up, their uh, budget line moves outwards, and so they have more options available to them. If they then choose minimally rationally, they have the option to pick something that they would like better than what they had before. And so at least utility is not decreasing in um, increasing income. But so um, the, way the, the way economists think about um, income-based measures are as proxies for well-being in much this way. So they believe that income is correlated with welfare, utility, in the sense of preference satisfaction. And they think that um, income can be costly efficacious under certain circumstances. Um, and so what I'm proposing here is, is very similar to this. I want to say that um, we can use happiness measures as proxies for well-being under a wide range of conditions because happiness measures correlate with a, 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 a perfect welfare measure um, and that happiness might be costly efficacious in bringing more welfare about um, in certain ways and under certain conditions. And so there is a, a perfectly standard way on this um, view according to which subjective well-being data can be used to extract information relevant to welfare assessment in a systematic, non-ad hoc um, manner. Now, why would you want to be a preference satisfaction theorist? Well, um, here's why. Um, I, I want to propose that the fact that preference satisfaction views are so helpful, that they allow us to make sense of such a large part of this literature, is in and of itself a reason for us to adopt such views. Okay? I think it's a reason to think, um, at least provisionally, that preference satisfaction accounts are correct, accounts of well-being. And it's reason to think of subjective measures as <coughs> representing, however imperfectly, welfare in the sense of preference satisfaction. I'll rely here on a quote from um, James Griffin. This is from one of the very first pages of his book, Well-Being, where he says, we can't just ask, what is the best account of well-being? Before we can properly explain it, we have to know the context in which it is to appear and the work it needs to do there, nor can we first fix on the best account of well-being and independently ask about its measurement. One proper ground for choosing between conceptions of well-being would be that one lends itself to the deliberation that we must do and another one does not. 
I take it that Griffin is not completely rejecting armchair philosophy, right? He clearly thinks that there's a space for it. But I, I take it that what he's saying here is that armchair philosophy is not going to be enough, or it's not going to cover all the reasons why you might adopt a particular view of, of well-being. The idea being that there are certain deliberations that we want to do. Some philosophical accounts allow us to do them better. And to the extent that a given philosophical account allows us to do that, that's a consideration in its favor. Right? Not the only kind of consideration one might think of, but one such um, consideration. Moreover, the preference satisfaction framework is really eminently workable in this context. Um, ordinarily, when I, when I talk about these things, I go from here to talking about Dan's and Ori's work, which I think is the most sophisticated um, and elaborate um, economic work that's relying on these sorts of areas that are trying to incorporate happiness as something you can have preferences over rather than something that acts as a proxy directly for her or a synonym of, of utility. So instead of talking about that, which uh, you, know, uh, you all already know about, I'll offer this visual um, from the OECD Better Life Index, which is something you can look up online. Um, if you look it up on your computers, it moves. It's very, um, it's very fancy. But basically what it allows you to do is um, to register your preferences. So over here you have all the OECD countries ranked um, in terms of quality of life or, or better life from, in this case, from Denmark through Turkey. The beauty of this um, approach here is that you get to say what your preferences are over some things you might care about. So I don't know if you guys can read this, but here's <coughs> housing, income, jobs, community, education, environment, civic engagement, and so on. These are things one might care about, right? By moving these sliders over here, you get to register how important each of these things is to you. So in this case, I just picked stuff randomly. <coughs> I picked, you know, community is up here, jobs has some weight, environment has certain weight, education has a little bit of weight and whatever. And as you move the sliders, Dan looks like he's on it, <laughs> these uh, <laughs> images here will, will move. All right? So um, as you slide these sliders, the ranking will shift um, and it'll tell you which country is the best one to live in for <laughs> you, right? given your values. And the nice thing about this approach, and the reason why I think this is so um, helpful, is that life satisfaction is one of the things here that you might care about. So I gave a lot of weight to life satisfaction here, just for, um, for the fun of it. And then you'll find, uh, predictably, right, that Denmark comes out on top, Australia, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, New Zealand, and so on, all the way down to Turkey and, um, and Russia. And so this is a, a nice illustration, I encourage you to, to go look this up, of what um, uh, the result might look like if we take happiness seriously, but we treat it as an object of preference um, uh, and an argument in the utility function. Now, um, there's this obvious problem with preference satisfaction views, right? Which is that uh, preferences are sometimes, perhaps frequently, the result of ignorance and irrationality. So I'll make the move everyone's expecting me to make and say that I think that what really matters from the welfare assessment point of view are the preferences that you would have if you were ideally rational and perfectly informed. I know this opens um, a whole can of worms. I'll be glad to talk about the, the complications here. Um, but the central thing I want to point out is that um, while it's sometimes argued that we couldn't even in principle know what these idealized preferences would be, I think that's wrong. I think it's true that we don't in fact know what our idealized preferences are, um, uh, what preferences we would have under these counterfactual conditions. But I don't see that it would be in principle impossible to study them using scientific means. <clears throat> and so physicists, for example, apparently successfully study things like frictionless planes, right? Not because they've actually, <clears throat> sorry, not because they've actually seen one, but because they know how to study them using more sophisticated scientific uh, uh, techniques, right? So they might study planes that approximate um, fric frictionlessness and see how various systems behave as frictionlessness goes to, uh, to uh, uh, the limit, right? Uh, and we might do the same thing for preferences. Uh, it seems to me that it ought to be possible experimentally to put people in a context where you elicit their preferences, such as they are, and you then tutor them um, 
in uh, straight thinking and the facts. And so you could expose people to information about various choices that they're making um, when it comes to careers and, and so on. And you could track how their preferences, how the trade-offs they make change in light of, of new information. If you find that those um, graphs converge to something, then that would give you license to say, um, right, it'd be an inductive argument, but you'd have license to say that that's something like what the preferences would be in the limit as people become ideally rational and ideally uh, and perfectly well informed. And so if this is true, that idealized preferences are in principle open to scientific study, we don't have to be repressed objective list theorists. So one common argument against preference satisfaction views, of course, is that um, you know, everything you're doing is that you're identifying a couple of things that are objectively good, and then you're imagining that people would want that if they were ideally rational and perfectly informed and so on, and then you're really an objective list theorist. But I don't think we have to be that. I think we can study these things um, in the lab quite easily using techniques that by and large already exist. I'm not aware of any work that already does this. Um, uh, if you are aware of any, I'd, I'd love to know about it. Yeah, you, okay, good, great. So you'll tell me about it in, <laughs> in just a moment. So, um, so great. I'll, I'll finish this, well, I'll leave you with, with this image, which is um, a picture I took in, in Stockholm. I was running around last summer, around this time of the year when high school is up and there's a lot of public drunkenness and littering and so on. This is somebody, presumably a private citizen, who put up a sign saying, littering is disrespectful, unintelligent, and pathetic. You too will think so in due time. What I think is fascinating about this is that the author uh, recognizes that the people who litter, who by and large are high school kids, don't in fact agree that littering is disrespectful, unintelligent, and pathetic. Right? But she thinks as these people grow up, they'll come to agree with, with him or with her. And uh, the author apparently thinks, I don't know what sort of illusions the author has, right? but the author apparently thinks that pointing this out to these youthful degenerates will help them see that they ought not to engage in littering behavior right now. And so I take this to suggest that at least sometimes um, the ordinary folk tend to invoke these idealized preferences when they're talking to one another, uh, keeping philosophers um, out of the picture, which I think is uh, nice. So in conclusion, I think preference satisfaction uh, accounts offer principal answers to some questions we want to ask, including the question under what conditions um, happiness uh, measures can be used as proxies for well-being. I think that constitutes a reason for us to adopt these preference satisfaction views and to think of subjective measures as representing um, preference satisfaction rather than um, anything else. And so uh, in all, if we want to take subjective well-being seriously, which I think we should, right, uh, we should all become preferentialists. Thank you very much. What I found fascinating was that he decided to argue against littering by littering on the bench. <laughs> uh, and I will just mention, I'll, I'll abuse my privilege a little bit, I'll say, you know, the study I know which I think is along the lines of what you're looking for is Thurgood Marshall argued in Furman versus Georgia, an early capital punishment case, not that early, that, um, that uh, if people were <coughs> informed about capital punishment, they would oppose it. And as a result, some people did interesting studies by giving more and more information about capital punishment. Turned out he was right. The more they were informed about capital punishment, uh, the more they opposed it. Uh, and of course, then the, uh, the people on the other side said, well, I don't know that shows anything. Uh, and the <laughs> argument went on, but it was interesting. I'll, I'll stop my little tirade there, though. And uh, I'm going to vigorously impose the full hand for a new question versus finger for a follow-up uh, rule here. And then I'll just go around the room and I'll just do one. Who else? Put your hand up if you have a question. One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, they and then we'll do them in that order. Whether they're a full hand or a finger. Well, the fingers can come in between the full hands. I won't turn to number two until all the fingers on number one are done. Oh, don't tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Eric, I had a question for you uh, toward the end. Looks like you're moving toward something like Griffin's view again, uh, that what matters for happiness or well-being is something like uh, ideally informed preference satisfaction, or ideally informed preferences. So, my question is on the ambiguity of ideally uh, informed preferences. Do we mean something like fully informed or rather optimally informed? And what I mean by optimally is something like what Downs would mean, 
and that is uh, the level of information that you would gather if you understood all of the relevant opportunity costs of your time. I take it that the second view is more plausible than the first, and the first view, um, where ideally informed means something like fully informed, is so unrealizable that it's not worth taking seriously as a normative standard. What do you think about that? Uh, I should preface this by saying that the quote from Griffin was a description of preference hedonism, or a what he calls eclectic views, he didn't actually endorse that in that passage. It was just that, you know. But you're endorsing the ideally informed. I'm endorsing the preference satisfaction views with the additional assumption that what counts are the preferences that you would have if you were perfectly informed and ideally rational. And to me, that means if you were fully informed. Notice that uh, there's no requirement that you be fully informed, right? So that might be an impossibility. Everything it means is that we should think of what would make you better off in this world in terms of what preferences you would have if you were ideal, ideally rational and perfectly informed. Just a quick follow-up. So is this a finger on your... Okay, yeah. yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, this is, I think it's a really important thing to... an important distinction, right, when we're talking about ideally informed. Uh, so given the idea that we're rationally ignorant about most things in the world, about how your microwave works, about how all kinds of things work around us, Surely we don't want to base any kind of normative standard for well-being on full information about everything that matters or might matter in our lives. Don't we want to base the normative standard on the kinds of trade-offs that rational individuals make? And if so, then we want optimal information, not full information. Ideal. What awkward consequences would follow, do you think, if we go with fully informed here rather than optimally informed? What's the downside of doing that? Well, in some sense... Huh, Given that we could never, in principle, be there, um, and given that something like odd implies can, if we're talking about a normative condition for uh, uh, well-being, then we want it to be at least, in some sense, sensitive to the time costs and the monetary costs and other kinds of cognitive costs of gathering information. Right? We want to limit the set of possible uh, preferences that might uh, co constitute or contribute toward our well-being. I don't. And that's one way of doing it. I don't see that. I mean, I, there's a similar debate in rationality, though, where people say that whatever your conception of rationality is, it's got to be one that ordinary humans can realistically live up to or something. I don't share that intuition. I don't see why I should have it. And in the case of physics, the fact that frictionless planes are unattainable, even in principle, is no reason to tell physicists not to use them in their theorizing, right? Can I mention one thing here also? Um, so one thought you could have is that there are certain preferences that turn out to be relatively stable under arbitrarily large increases of information about microwaves, um, and stable across individuals, stable within individuals. Um, so it's not as if the, we can't assemble some information about these idealizations. And um, similarly, suppose you ask, what's the ideal uh, degree of belief to have in scientific theory T? Well, you could say it should be relative to all the evidence. Well, no one's got all the evidence. Let's ask how expensive it would be to acquire the evidence. You might say, that's not relevant to the question of what degree of belief it's best to have in the theory. It's relevant to the question of what I should do with my time, but it's not relevant to the question of what's the best degree of belief to have. That's relevant to full information. Jim had a finger. I think it's basically just saying the same thing in a slightly different way, but it seems to me that this is Partly what I was trying to make, the point I was trying to make um, briefly at the beginning of my talk about complexity, namely, um, sometimes people object to full information accounts. And, but I'm not a full information theorist, but I have sympathies in that direction for some <laughs> versions of it. But, you know, they object that, well, if full information isn't practical, you can't actually have full information. But the point is to give an account of what would be the conditions that would yield the correct answer, the right answer then you may actually need a different account, which is your account of what to study, how to mm -hmm. proceed, what, best to, to what will be the best answer we can reasonably get. But part of the point is that the best answer you can reasonably get may fall short of perfect, and that's what your theory should tell you. And it will predict, in fact, that actually having very good judgments about your good might, in certain conditions, depending on what factors turn out to be relevant, be very difficult to have. And that actually just seems right to me. One thing is a theory about what, what well-being is, and another is what's the best we can do to try to make the best judgments we can. 
Those are two different questions. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with that. Was that an yeah. objection? No, that was no, no, support. No, no. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said they're probably just saying the same thing slightly over again. But okay. Let me, let me say a finger on this. I, I think you can also avoid this type of problem, this type of doubt about full information by simply saying the preferences that count towards well-being are the preferences which are such that no further information would change them, right? You don't have to know it all. You don't have to be in full information. You just have to be in a state such that this is the stability that Peter was talking about. And right. then you say, well, we're in that kind of state often. But we can't. We, we don't have full information, in but, but the stuff about how the microwave are. works is not going to change anything. Right? Anyway, that's just a suggestion. Yeah, we have another finger. Yeah, so, so following up, actually, on what all four of you said, um, I like a lot uh, your framework, Eric, uh, as you know. We're, tr we're trying to oper operas operationalize it. <laughs> um, the question is... Um, uh, part of the switch that we made in, in our work from uh, thinking of preferences as defined over a vector of uh, consumer goods to switching to thinking about preferences as defined over a vector of what we call fundamental aspects, or you can call it whatever you want, but uh, emotions and other things, is this informational issue that I only like a microwave if I know and understand correctly what it does, and you know, Ten years later, I actually also learned that it's dangerous, so I like it less, etc. This is very information dependent. Whereas uh, my preferences over, for example, life satisfaction may be less information dependent in the sense that uh, I know what I mean by it, and you can tell me now facts about the world, and f physicists could make advances in understanding things. It's not going to change. So we also think that there is an, uh, this advantage of stability. And, uh, in this context, though, I, I have problems with Jennifer's theory because uh, J Jennifer yesterday said, uh, no, it's, I don't believe that you will actually, o over some of these emotions, I actually don't believe your preferences, and I will, because you cannot know, right, maybe I'm misrepresenting, but it's, it's, uh, and, and, and actually I'm going to impose on you exactly about the goods that I think are maybe the, the best in terms of the informational uh, issues because I really don't need much information to know my preference over them. Uh, Jennifer says exactly the opposite. She says, I'll believe your preference over a microwave, but I will override your preference over uh, suffering because I know better than you. And so I, I'm trying to, 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 to uh, see if you guys have something to say or, you know, to, uh, to bridge this gap or you, you, you guys just disagree. I hope I represented everybody correctly, everybody's opinions. Well, one feature of the difference between microwave and uh, preference satisfaction is one's an intrinsic preference and the other one isn't an intrinsic preference. And it's to be expected that uh, instrumental preferences are highly dependent upon all kinds of, of information. Uh, you might think your life experience up to now gives you a whole lot of information about intrinsic preferences. They're quite generic and they're probably going to turn out to be very similar to the <laughs> others in this room and fairly stable under new information. And so one thing to, to add, I think, to the full information account is that often full information requires experience. There are some things that we don't know what they're like until we've experienced them. And so an, another way in which we get information is by Mill's experiments in life. This is how we do it, but th we, there may be some intrinsic preferences that are very widely shared, very stable, and um, we probably shouldn't second guess those. Uh, I, may I respond? Let him respond. Yeah, I just want to add that as a, as a methodological matter, of course, for any practical purposes, you need to restrict the number of things that people can have preferences over, right? You can't computationally deal with the problem if you have too many of them. And then it makes a lot of sense to focus on the intrinsic preferences precisely for these reasons, right? They're fairly stable. You can argue that people have reasonable amount of information about them and, and so on. Um, the only reason I, I think you still have to move to the, or the main reason why I think you still have to move to an, an informed preference account is that the intrinsic preferences might be inconsistent, right? If you elicit these in a real framework, you might find that people have inconsistent preferences over them. And that's why you have to ask, what would these preferences be if the person were ideally rational and perfectly informed? 
So that's the opposite. In that sense, it's the opposite of uh, of, of Jen's theory. Am I interpreting it correctly in, in terms of su suffering? I think that suffering is probably an intrinsic mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, element of this set. And, and yes. Jennifer says, no, here I'm, I'm never going to believe, no matter how much life experience you have, I'm not going to believe you, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to impose some outside order. Well, above the bar that Jennifer yeah. proposes, we all agree, right? So in the limit, if you just lower the bar enough, we'll come to agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, liberals just have a lower bar. <laughs> yeah. just a, Easy uh, grade. So, so one, one point is that Peter, Peter was too modest. It's a footnote. And Peter you know, wrote seminal stuff on looking on how to win idealized preferences and looking to um, idealized preferences or what he calls the reduction basis as a physical basis for idealized preferences as a basis for moral facts and his work on moral reality. So anyone who thinks about this should really credit Peter. Um, the, the point um, on full information about intrinsic preferences, of course, <coughs> the project of Richard Grant mm -hmm. and his whole idea of cognitive psychotherapy was to say that full information about the origin, mm -hmm. the personal or perhaps social origin of your intrinsic preferences might lead you to change those. So for example, we found out that your preference for life satisfaction is something which is shared by baboons and rats, and mm -hmm. you understood that, you might change that. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually be too confident that it's only with respect to instrumental as opposed to intrinsic preferences that full information is relevant. And again, this is the whole, you know, this is Brian's idea of cognitive psychotherapy. Yeah. No, I, I didn't say it was only with respect to, I just said well, we that. Tend, we tend, I mean, we tend to. I mean, it, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, no, 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 you're, I think you're entirely right. And uh, I think understanding where our preferences come from, as I say, might give us ground to have more confidence in some of them, because we think they're responding to the kinds of things that they purport to be responding to. So I, I would agree. Any other fingers on this? Who was number two? Dan. I think it was me. Is it Dan? Okay. Somewhere in this direction. Uh, you have to remember your number. I can't remember. <laughs> um, Eric, on the, uh, the literature on deliberative polling might be useful in terms of what people's informed preferences might be like. I mean, there may be social desirability if I could come up. I think James Fishkin has done that stuff. Um, and just on the, the uh, preference satisfaction, so as you've pointed out, uh, you know, I've, I've somewhat in that direction. Um, but uh, what do you think of, that you could distinguish? Uh, the, say policymakers adopting a preference satisfaction theory of well-being and saying this is the right theory of well-being and so this is what we're going to promote versus saying well normatively speaking for policy purposes what we ought to promote is preference satisfaction but, be, but we don't think it's our business to proclaim this is the right theory of well-being and then because if, if the policymakers adopt it as a theory of well-being then from and then they're up against you know Aristotelian to say oh that's wrong, and then they're also telling citizens who are Aristotelians and among other things that well you're just you have this stupid theory of well-being of what's good for you, uh, we'll promote your preferences anyway just because you know they're your preferences but they're really wrong about ultimately the nature of what's good for you. When it comes to the policy prescriptions, I, th I think I, broadly speaking, agree with you. So um, we had this discussion recently. Somebody on my campus proposed starting up an initiative called the Well-Being University, where you know <laughs> the well-being of students and staff ought to be promoted and so on. And at that level of generality, no one can disagree with this, right? There are too many suicides and so on among students, and your increased well-being would be wonderful. But then people have all these perfectionist tendencies, right? So somebody gets up and says, well-being is X, Y, and Z, and that's what we should promote. <laughs> And in this context, I did not argue that we ought to enhance everyone's preference satisfaction. Um, I, I argued for trying to provide the conditions under which people can themselves develop a conception of their good and um, try to execute it and so on. And so in, as a matter of political philosophy, I think I, I agree with you, although as a matter of, you know, of when it comes to accounts of well-being, we might disagree still. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Well, there's an interesting connection here because you might argue for this idea of something like uh, consumer sovereignty or something like that on the grounds that you think it's actually people are better informed often about what would be good for them than other people could be or what would make their life go better in various ways than other people would be. And so um, I think you can actually, it, it's not just expedient in a way to adopt the idea of uh, informed standards as a policy basis. You might think you know, where would we find the best information about what would make uh, Walter's life go better? <laughs> um, and so we give uh, him some sovereignty in, in answering the question. Any finger? Yeah, 
Uh, two fingers. Um, I mean, I find this is this is all very interesting, and I'm certainly making me think differently about how we might use these metrics. But just from the policy application perspective, I just don't. I think the the idea that you would give policymakers an ideal theory of well-being and they would buy into it and it would go. I mean, the process <laughs> is so messy and so dirty and so dumb that you know we should you know wh whoever wants to develop a theory of well-being that's compelling enough and can bring some evidence to bear and then put it into the simplest possible terms that can't get messed up <laughs> is the only application you could think of for policy so there's I just you know it's just the idea that we would give a policymaker a theory of well-being is you know just it, it's it, it, I, I, I think that the theory is very important for informing where we get to what we eventually give to policymakers, but there are many steps down the road. So I think that's exactly right. Uh, my former colleague Don Ross has a paper where he talks about development economics in, in Africa, where he talks about how really the best thing to do is to narrow it down as much as we can and look only at women's income. So he's aware of all the literature about capabilities, he's aware of all the subjective well-being stuff, but he thinks from personal experience working in this area that the best thing to do is to give women more money because when they get more money all these other wonderful things happen they invest in education for the kids and clean water and, and so on and for a context like that that might be the way to go now what I see myself <coughs> as doing is not developing a theory that we ought to present to I don't know the president uh, uh, or something to try to execute but rather a principled answer to the question under what condition can we present policymakers with this measure, under what conditions would it be better to present them with this one, um, and so on. So the background theory gives you an argument for presenting policymakers with one thing as opposed to another. So the argument for saying, you know, increase income among women is that if you do, if you tell them that and they act on it, presumably, then more preferences will be satisfied. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's there's a, the background. There's also, I mean, if you think about cases like medical decision making and so on, um, you know, doctors are supposed to be experts and they're trying to decide what's best for a patient and, um, you know, we tell them, well, you're supposed to use something like informed consent or something like that and they might think, well, this is irresponsible of me to use something like this. But if you thought in the background, people's informed consent, if I really could make it informed and if it really were uncoerced and so on, would be a good guide, then um, it seems to me actually believing that something like that's possible can underwrite a more respectful medical practice uh, as, a, as a direct matter of policy. Any other fingers on this? Who's number three? All right. um, so this is for Eric. So, uh, kind of, um, so in your talk, you move from um, certain kinds of conscious judgments about outcomes to mental states to preferences. Yeah. And you said, and there was a question here too about um, okay. um, about exactly the move that you wanted to make. And you said, well, we move, we can move from these claims, like I guess, in affective psychology and sociology, about what matters is you know what it's like for us, sort of you know, our consciousness at the end of the um, like, to you know talking about mental states generally. And that worried me because um, most of our mental states aren't conscious, and so I didn't see that you um, actually. I thought that move was was very quick and then you move from mental states to sort of preferences and you know you have to I mean I guess I'm especially worried that as soon as you allow in all kinds of mental states apart from conscious mental states that you really get a completely, you get a completely different we're talking about something completely different potentially so why did you make that move or did you want to or you just sort of I do take myself to be talking about something dramatically different when I make the, made the move from preference hedonism to preference satisfaction accounts. Yeah. Um, and the move is justified by um, a couple of cases. So one of the things that I mentioned in the paper has to do with research on, on happiness and, and health, where um, all sorts of ill or bad health states have no effect on people's happiness in the long run. So suppose this is true. Suppose there's a condition like, um, you know, the lost leg that Adam Smith talks about that has no lasting effect on people's people's happiness. Um, I still want want to say, and I think you might agree, that um, losing your leg is a bad thing for you. And even holding all your mental states constant, if you lose your leg, that's a bad thing for you. And that cannot be captured within the preference hedonist framework because you have preferences only over mental states, or the only preferences that count are the ones you have on 
over conscious mental states. Yeah, so, so it's, I, it's I will the conscious <coughs> mental state thing I wanted to flag. Not just mental states, but conscious mental states. Right? Because, um, well, sorry. But, I, but that I, distinction doesn't matter to me. My, my final view, the one I want to commit myself to, does not depend on any such distinctions. That's what I'm worried about. Because I thought that the original motivation was that, look, it's the conscious mental states that people care about and they give as, as, what, as, um, as, you know, caring about that, those conscious outcomes are really what motivate some of these, um, these questions about, um, I guess, effective well-being. So I guess I don't understand your question. So people care about all sorts of things. They care about mobility, for example, above and beyond the happiness that mobility can yield. And because they care about it, and because it, it makes sense to me to say that, enhanced mobility can enhance your well-being, even holding the happiness constant, we should take into account people's preferences over things like mobility and, and legs um, and things. So why is that a, a concern? I think part of the worry was, um, as I understood you, you were saying, well, look, I'm capturing subjective well-being, right? Capturing? Capturing well-being. Well, okay, well, so, so the thought is that if you want subjective well-being, then you need conscious mental states. Well, so that's typically how people understand subjective well-being, right? That's right. In that's terms right. of conscious mental states. That's right. So you have to keep the conscious mental states in there to the extent that, to the extent that we're still talking about subjective well-being, we drop the conscious, the requirement of, con uh, of conscious mental states. Then it seems like we're departing from what we thought we were talking about. I'm allowing people to have preferences over conscious mental states as well as things like. But it's the as well as I'm worrying about. It's like I feel like you're adding more. You, you're adding more into what we thought we originally cared about. Um, it, it, are you, so, you, you, is the question whether you have intrinsic concern over states of affairs that have no conscious correlate? It's not that we wouldn't in some sense care about states of affairs or mental states that have no conscious correlate. Right. It's just that, um, it's not clear to me how we're supposed to care about them and how to, in a sense, um, feed in the impact they have on, say, subjective well-being without explicitly keeping the either the conscious conscious mental states in there or the whatever the effect is on conscious mental states. Well, we may have well-being, not subjective well-being. I mean, I, I think Eric's account is an account of well-being, and the claim just is that well-being is more than subjective well-being. And what and what I'm yeah, yeah I, I see that, and that's what I'm not. That's what that's that's. What I'm concerned about, because I thought some of the original motivation for some of the work basically required what I would think of as subjective well-being, which required a, 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 you know, an explicit connection to sort of conscious mental states. So, so what I started off by saying was that I think research on happiness can tell us something about the nature of the human condition. Right? And, 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 and what we really care about in the human condition is this talk about con conscious mental states. Well, that's, that's the worry. Well, maybe. Well, but well, all, the, all the insights that I get from the literature I can get through the lens of my preference satisfaction account. Why should I, what, so I'm saying why, okay. Uh, well, we have a sorry. finger over here that might be able to help. Go ahead. Yeah. What if preference, well, what if your two systems, uh, as Peter said, right, have different preferences? So if the <coughs> rational mind has uh, some set of preferences, but then the gut feeling has another set of preferences, and depending which one gets to choose, mm -hmm. you get a set of one or the other, right? That's, yeah, that's nice. Once you start talking about idealized preferences, though, I don't know that that would be much. No, of a but what is idealized? It doesn't mean there's one. They can be context dependent. Um, they, is there such a thing as an ideal, a fixed preference? Uh, for example, actually, the the uh, picture you showed in your presentation just says we might have preferences for littering when we're young, and then the, those preferences change as we grow older. Um, so there shouldn't be an idealized preference that fits us all if we just had enough information. Well, they could be, right? Yeah. Uh, I think the thought was that <coughs> you're more informed when you're older. It's not the age that distinguishes it's not, the one It's not the age. The <laughs> it's the it, it, yeah. It's maturation, right? So mm -hmm. enhanced yeah. rationality and so on. Yeah. So if I could just go back. My, my worry was that, what my worry was not, not that mm -hmm. if you want to build in more than kind of mm -hmm. conscious mental states or conscious, or sort of um, the, the, the feel, you want to say, the conscious feel of an outcome, it's not that it's wrong to do so. It's just that I think we're, we've changed. We've very subtly changed the question and what we're and what we're addressing, and we're no longer talking about the kinds of outcomes that maybe we originally cared about. Well, suppose the original question was, "What matters to people?" 
That's what I'm supposing the yeah. original question was. And let's just focus on the conscious states now. And suppose one thing we discover is that when people are offered choices between situations which affect their conscious states in certain ways or bring about certain outcomes without affecting their conscious states, they constantly have a subtle preference in some cases for the outcome rather than the conscious state, like that their children be taken care of rather than that they think their children are taken care of. And so then we would be back at the original origin, we're saying what seems to matter to people and we would be looking at their conscious states for guidance in figuring out what matters to people, but their conscious states contain content that isn't itself a conscious state. That's that's fine. What I'm saying is I thought that needs to be explicitly okay, addressed good. Yeah. and brought into yeah, the right. account. But I think that would be the way to... Good. I see. Well, th thanks okay. for clarifying that. Yeah. Any other comments about this? Okay, who's number four? You were number three? I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Who is next in line? Go ahead. Um, so those are both fascinating talks, and I have a zillion questions, but I'll restrict it to one, uh, to, to Eric. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if, if you um, if you look into the history of measuring subjective well-being, the idea of measuring it goes back even before the 1920s. Bentham imagined, you know, that, that you would want to measure happiness. Edgeworth famously talked about a heat limiter. Um, so why? So I, I guess I'm wondering, were there attempts to measure subjective well-being before the 1920s, and if not? Why not? I mean, Galton was out measuring people's height and intelligence and all sorts of things in the 1880s. Yeah, it's a good question. So what I did in my historical work was to go back to, um, to go look at the references in contemporary publications on happiness and satisfaction and look up the oldest ones and then go to them and look up who they cited and so on, trace that back. And uh, the work seemed to come to an end in the 1920s or something. Um, that's not to deny that there were people earlier who tried to do similar things. Um, everything I'm saying is that this particular research trend, this research program that we're all in some sense or other part of, appears to have emerged um, shortly after World War I. And what happened there, I think, on a large scale was that um, as a result of personality psychology and all that, psychologists convinced themselves that they could, in a broad way, right, that they could measure things like personality differences and mental states and so on. And once they convinced themselves that they could do it, then people started asking, well, why aren't we looking at happiness, right? Because that's, after all, the thing that ultimately matters. And so there were developments in psychometrics, really, that I think drove the emergence of um, um, the science of happiness in that era. There were previous people. So there's a fascinating paper published in 1918 by a Harvard um, psychiatrist, uh, Meyerson, who proposed the development of the field of eupathics. Uh, as in well feeling, right? Which he describes very much like the way positive psychologists describe now. Um, he also characterized it as the gentler, kinder cousin of eugenics, um, like focusing on you know, the mental rather than the bodily or whatever. Um, so there were contributions like that, but the, the research, the continuous research stream that we're all in some sense or other part of appears to have emerged in the 20s. Who was number five? So a question to Peter. Uh, I asked it as a clarification question, yeah. but I'm still confused. Um, you said that, so I, I like a lot of this theory, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm trying to solve a, a, an apparent conflict that I didn't understand. So you said that um, in general we're positive so mm -hmm. that we don't just sit doing nothing. So I understood it as um, we expect on average our actions mm -hmm. to yield uh, positive results and so our expectations are positive and this yeah. is what's keeping us going. So this doesn't sit to me with, uh, when I lose my job, mm -hmm. according to this theory, I should be the most positive one could imagine to make me, to motivate me now to, because now it's really urgent for me to get up and make action to improve my lot. and. It, but now I'm actually getting depressed, according to what we, I said a minute ago, then I should just sit there doing nothing, which is exactly the opposite. So I just don't see how the two can be. How can you say that we are po po being positive motivates us? But actually, when we need motivation the most, mm -hmm. it's the negativity that motivates us. Well, if you take, um, take the case of unemployment, 
you need to have uh, a shift in the individual's activities, so to speak, when they become unemployed. <clears throat> They've got to focus on different things. So you need for them to be dissatisfied with doing things the same way that they've been doing them. And so you need it to be the case that the system that had been telling him all along you're doing okay, you don't have to consider leading a new life, you're doing okay, you don't have to consider leading a new life, that bit of emotional support has got to change so that the person actually feels an element of frustration or dissatisfaction with his current state. Because frustration is a motivator. And it's, you know, frustration is a motivational state. And you need the person to have some degree of discontent. But suppose the person just got super satisfied with their state. Well, then they also wouldn't try to do anything. Because if they were super satisfied, then uh, no act that they could take would have a chance of increasing their uh, utility. So you need it to be the case that the person is dissatisfied with the status quo, that that dissatisfaction focuses their activity on certain kinds of responses, namely the needs that have been created by their unemployment, and that that therefore gives a positive valence to doing the things that will help them find a job. So it's, it's very much like the way that um, uh, hunger or something like that works. Hunger is a negative condition. It motivates you to seek food. Um, why? Because until you eat, you're going to feel hunger. Similarly, unemployment is a negative condition. You have lost your social uh, connectedness. You've lost your source of uh, material support. You have to do something about that. You, being in your current state is an unsatisfactory condition. You're unhappy in your current state. But what does hunger do? It makes food seem especially positive. It focuses your attention on getting food and on food related so activities. I understand that. So now back to, so why yeah. do we have to be positive as a baseline? I just don't understand that. If, yeah. Make us a little bit uh, negative yeah. uh, as a baseline and we will always uh, look for yeah. things to improve, to improve the right. world, to yeah. take new action, to, you know, to better ourselves. Yeah. Otherwise, it just seems like, uh, so, uh, I mean, another way to say it is that I, I don't see what empirical evidence would falsify your theory because, uh, yeah. it, you know, basically the, it can explain anything. Uh, oh. Negativity is a motivator, positivity is a motivator. Well, there are different kinds of motivators. And um, although you wanted to say something? Was that? I think, I think somebody else is in front of me. Oh, yeah. but uh, let, me, let me just With say... two fingers say, waiting. Yeah, yeah say, say a bit more about this. Again, um, it, it, it is a falsifiable theory because it's making predictions about what kinds of representational states you're actually going to find in the organism when you look. Is it the case that when the person becomes unemployed, the utility that they assign to job-related activities goes up, and the disutility that they assign to continuing their current activity uh, also goes up. And so it makes a very specific measurable prediction here. And the way to think about the positivity point is what happens in depression, yeah. chronic depression? In chronic depression, you're systematically incapable of generating positive interest or positive expectations. And it is a highly dysfunctional state to be in. People stop trying things, they, they uh, expect that they won't succeed, they uh, become uh, incapable of decision because they can't invest enough positivity in one choice as opposed to another, so they become terrific prevaricators, they get involved in circular ruminative reasoning. And so look at a case where we deprive the system of positive affect, and what we get is this highly dysfunctional state of lack of interest. But that's not what happens when you lose your job. That's a different dimension. And that's, that's right. So it's, it's quite important that, okay. um, and, and I think people who do the psychology of this would say, it's quite important to distinguish the fact that someone who's unemployed is depressed in the sense that their sense of subjective well-being goes down. But if they're only reactively depressed, the term in the literature is, that's a functional state for the individual. If they become chronically or major depressed, then they have a dysfunctional response to it. Yeah, so that's the, that's the picture. First thing, let, let me just follow up, and I, I think this mm -hmm. is, was one of the very interesting points about your talk, and mm -hmm. I, I've found myself very sympathetic to the overall framing, but in that mm -hmm. context, there yeah. are a couple of things that 
troubled me. Mm -hmm. This was one. So uh, if you use your, what do we have to imagine for a, an organism to survive, and let's assume it's a conscious organism, yeah. there must be something that moves you from an inert state to action. Yeah. And it's easy for us to interpret that as it, the, the outcome of the mm -hmm. action is positive relative mm -hmm. to staying at rest. Uh -huh. And I think you kind of made that argument, which, mm -hmm. which seems perfectly reasonable. Now, if we take this question up, um, answering a question about my current state yeah. and answering positively, that's really a theory about mm -hmm. my history and where I am now. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing required for me to move mm -hmm. from an inert state to action that requires me to have a positive theory about where I am right now or a negative theory. All you need mm -hmm. is to say that, and it's, you know, I, I'm yeah. even nervous about using positive negative in this context, yeah. but there's something motivating yeah. uh, in, that I expect as the outcome of the action relative to remaining inactive. And, right. and so yes. you need, and I think let's give you that you've established that. I don't think it follows from that that you have established anything about our theory about our current state. Well, and except the different yeah. yeah. argument, different right. terms. The um, part of the burden of the first part of the talk was that uh, what your current states, your current effective states, are built for is anticipation and prospective action guidance. So if it's the case <coughs> that what this state's functional role is, is just the one that you were describing to motivate in that way, then the current state is going to be positive as well. Because, because I built up a series of positive things and, and yeah. I would sort of inductively undermine my uh, motivation to move. In effect, yeah. I mean, that would that'd be a sort of an intelligently articulated way of saying it. But yeah, the idea is that these are prospective states, not retrospective right. states. Okay. Yeah. Well, just on this, on this point, I mean, really fascinating stuff, but just um, having thought a lot about, you know, do you need some frustration to make progress, yeah. and then looking also not from mm -hmm. a um, philosophical perspective, and mainly with evaluative metrics, but that you know people that have higher prospects for the future are much more willing to take a negative state and invest in their future for themselves and their children. And I have empirical data on this for yeah. you know people in all different contexts mm -hmm. around the world. So it's kind of at some level, or a, maybe some negative frustration is good, but there seems to it seems that that, that there is some positive prospects, you know, if people so that people have some sense of where they're going matters a lot to whether frustration goes to investments in the future, could, it could be migrating, it could be making a sacrifice to work yeah. longer hours to invest in your kids, or protesting on the street and burning yourself up like the guy yeah. in, in, you know, T Tarek Square. So I think that's, I, I think there's some, you know, at least empirically, mm -hmm. There, it's still complicated, but there's some balance between the positive and the negative, but the positive, I think, is incredibly important. Yeah. Um, and, and we even see it with high levels of inequality that are very persistent. It's very hard for people at the bottom, where there's no mobility, to maintain a positive yeah. you know, prospect for the future, and so you mm -hmm. don't, what do you invest in? You don't bother. Yeah. Back, and then they're related to that, these negative states can kind of develop, and I hate to talk about norms with such an expert around, but uh -huh. can develop into kind of bad equilibrium group norms. So yeah. the empirical literature mm -hmm. for well-being and unemployment shows that it's terrible for your, uh, for your well-being. But it's much less bad if everybody around you is unemployed, right? right? Everybody just kind of adapts to a yeah. more negative state. A lot of crime and corruption is bad for your well-being. It's a lot less bad for your well-being if there's a lot of it because you're used to it. You just, you know, people adapt to these kind of bad norms, right. bad health norms as well. Um, and then just a last point on this, there's a really nice new paper, it's about two years old, by Alan Kruger, where they looked at sadness. So they really were looking specifically at, at affect in the American Time Use Survey mm -hmm. among the unemployed and job searches. And what they found is that, as they, they looked across the day, that for, for unemployed people, um, this is during the crisis, looking for a job was the saddest part of the day. Yeah. And the longer those job searches went on with no success, mm -hmm. the, the sadness levels increase and finally they stop looking for jobs. Yeah. So again, it highlights that without some sort of 
dissatisfaction. You, yeah, you can you can you can tolerate frustration and mm -hmm. hardship and challenges, but if there is no kind of right. light at the end of the tunnel, I think yeah. I Apparently think people, people can fall into these really kind of bad state yeah. norm traps. Yeah, people apparently who are actively searching for a job explore, ex report a lower level of subjective well-being than the highly discouraged unemployed who stopped looking. Right, so they, for, the, the for just latter ones have just fallen into this, yeah. you know, going nowhere. Normal. Right, and if I could say something about the social referencing, um, if you think that what this system is doing is giving you relative information about how well you're doing at meeting these basic needs given the feasibility set, if you know that your feasibility set is one in which everybody's struggling and barely eating by, then your system shouldn't tell you, you're doing an especially bad job. <laughs> it should tell you, keep struggling, right? But if you're in a situation where you can see that uh, your situation is unusual and there are lots of other people with jobs and the system should say, what are they doing, <laughs> right? Uh, and so if you think of it in informational terms, the social referencing makes point, makes, makes a great deal of sense because that is relevant to the feasibility set, the resources you can mobilize, the options that you face. And so there's a difference uh, neurologically between, uh, and physiologically between habituation and accommodation. Uh, when I habituate to something, I get used to it and I go back to a baseline state. In accommodation, accommodation occurs if, I, if you move me to uh, Peru, to a high altitude, uh, you'll find at first I have this uh, altitude sickness, I'm uh, nauseous, I can't act. Uh, eventually my blood uh, hemoglobin goes up and I accommodate to the high altitude. And then my activity level returns to normal. But notice that my activity level returning to normal doesn't mean I'm in the same state that I was in at sea level. It's because my state has changed, because I've had a physiological accommodation to the situation, that I can have an adaptive response to it. And so when we look at these, this information about return to baseline, the evidence, I don't think, supports the idea that it's a habituation response. It seems to me that it's an accommodation response, and that's how it can be that people can actually gain resources by a process that doesn't yield a net gain or gain capabilities by a process that doesn't yield a net gain in, in life satisfaction. They, they have, like the people who've gotten more red blood cells, they've gained capacities. But the way to find that is not to find it in life satisfaction, but to look at what, what they now can do. And if I've been at a high altitude, this is what athletes do. <laughs> they go there to train to get better capacities to process oxygen. Is it a finger? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm wondering on, on um, these issues, have you seen the paper by um, Gary Becker and Luis Rayo? No. Uh, from a few years ago in, in the AER. They, they basically, it's, it's a similar perspective, they solve a mechanism design problem, which they interpret as natural selection, mm -hmm. for uh, optimal motivation, given that there are physiological constraints on how good or bad you can feel. Huh. And they, they argue that the kind of, hippie, the kind of uh, returning to baseline is the optimal solution to this problem and that you should expect mm -hmm. people to have rational expectations and use social mm -hmm. information about others oh, really? uh, to inform what that baseline okay. level should be. And the last question appropriately. <laughs> I'm very quick. I, I just, on preference hedonism. Um, Thanks. For Eric, um, there's a couple different things. One is just an observation. So you probably know this, but um, Sumner in his great book on welfare happiness and ethics classifies, so preference hedonism, just to be clear, right, is, is a view which says that well-being is a matter of satisfying your preferences over experiences. I mean, whether conscious or not, the preferences over mental states, or realizing those is, you know, what gives someone um, well-being. So Sumner in his book classifies both Mill and Sidgwick as preference hedonists. I don't know whether that's right, but that is, you know, Sumner in his book says that Bentham, Bentham is a sensational hedonist about well-being with that um, Mill and Sidgwick are preference hedonists. So I think it's important just to, you know, just to note that. I think the question was raised um, at one point about Kahneman. I mean, Kahneman's theory of objective happiness, and I co the paper with Walker and Sarin, is a preference hedonist theory. That is, he says, you know, that your well-being from a series of um, um, momentary states, momentary experiential states, uh, is a matter of uh, someone's preferences over that series of states. So again, it's kind of preference hedonism. So that is an observation. 
Um, now you say that you, so that's just, you know, just a, a footnote, which um, as an interpretive matter you say that this literature on SWB from the 50s and 60s, that in effect, you know, maybe they really were prefacing this about well-being. So one question there, I mean, you know, it's a question of interpretation, on, um, I don't have strong views about that, but a puzzle then is that, and, and, and you say that and you suggest that happiness um, is just the term they're using for the realization of preferences over experiences, right? So by happiness, they just mean um, getting the preferences over experiences that you want, right? If that's right, it's not clear why they use a separate uh, measure of life satisfaction, right? Why, why have both a happiness measure and a life satisfaction measure if they're preference hedonists? The third point, which is really a normative point, and I, I'm not a preference hedonist, right? But there is, and we were talking about this at lunch, I mean, the real problem well, there are two big problems for, for preferentialists. One we've talked a lot about, and Jenny's left, but this whole question of idealization. But there is this other big question of restriction, right, which Parfit famously identified with the strange from the train hypothetical, right? There are preferences over things that can be realized without affecting my well-being. I mean, my preference that there not be, you know, a nuclear catastrophe 100 years hence or 300 years hence. Uh, whether that happens or not, I'm going to be dead. My well-being is not going to be changed by that. Um, uh, uh, but that, yet that's a preference. So I think the puzzle for preference folks is not just to define the ideal conditions informationally, but also to, to decide how to restrict preferences, right? And it seems to me the best thing that can be said for preference hedonism as opposed to just straight preferentialism. So you reject preference hedonism normatively, you move to straight preferentialism with idealization, but that, that's a move too far. And, and what preference hedonists can say is, well, the relevant preferences are preferences about my life. Right? And what could be more about my life than what goes on in my head? I mean, that I think is the best case that can be made for that. And I don't think you really answered that case in, at least in this presentation. Uh, and I think by going all the way to straight preferentialism, you know, an implication is that if someone has a fully informed sort of moral preference for something and the moral preference is satisfied, they're better off. And that's, that, that's a problematic implication. So about Kahneman, first off, I think Feldman <coughs> is the best work on this. In his 2010 book, he talks about how you know, Kahneman starts off by talking about positive and desirable experiences and so on, but then he asks, what are those? Well, they're experiences that you want to continue, right? Which brings in this desire uh, right, framework. Right. And so I think somebody like Kahneman, at the very least, moves from the one interpretation to another. I think something similar goes on in the literature that I was talking about from the 60s and 70s. Um, I don't want to say that they were preference hedonists because the actual evidence dramatically underdetermines the, the hypothesis. There are passages where people speak as though they are. There are passages where they speak as though they're not. Um, um, I didn't quite um, define happiness the way I think you took me to. So the, most of these people talk about happiness and satisfaction as two separate states, both of which count. And so they talk about happiness as an effective state, um, satisfaction as a cognitive state. Many people argue that both of those matter. And people started looking at aff positive and negative affect, and then realized that they don't co vary like you'd expect. And so then people said absence of negative affect counts in the same way as presence of positive affect does. Um, but then there are passages where they say that all of these things matter because people care about these things, which is where you know it looks as though they might be um, preference hedonists. When it comes to the um, urge to restrict our preferences. I'm not so convinced that we have to. So in the case of the stranger on the train, Parfit says, you know, given that I never again give a... Do people know this case? Oh, yeah. So here, Parfit meets somebody on a train who is ill. Uh, Parfit is seized by the um, desire or the wish that the person get better. Then they part ways, and Parfit never, ever thinks about him again. Um, you know, the question is, should the fact that the stranger's illness is cured down the line be considered as you know, enhancing Parfit's well-being, and Parfit says clearly not. <coughs> um, but um, he, he, here's my take on that situation. So uh, Parfit apparently never thinks about this man again. He never does anything to enhance his well-being. Um, in terms of marginal rates of substitution, Parfit prefers everything else to enhancing this gentleman's health. He never donates money to a charity of the relevant kind in order to improve the chances that he's um, uh, cure and so on. What that suggests to me is that really we should say that Parfit does not have a preference for um, uh, this person's health. And insofar as, as he does, that preference, the intensity of that preference is completely swamped by everything else. And so 
I think that gives us license for saying that. But bear, bear the case, the department sends thing. money to the man without ever realizing, learning that the money gets there, the money gets there, and the man is cured. In that case, he does have a preference, but still, the man, the, 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 the man being cured, I, I would say, intuitively doesn't improve Parvet's well-being. Well, if he, Parvet really cares about this, and he, we know that he cares about it because he engages in certain kind of acts right. that would enhance his well-being, then I would say that uh, it, does, it does matter, mm -hmm. much like a person's child's health matters to the person's uh, well-being. Some people mm -hmm. would say that it can't possibly do that, right? but there my intuitions go very strongly in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Any comments on this? Then please join me in thanking Thank you.